So with this, I wanted to talk about invasive species, um, just interesting facts, details about specific invasive species, but then as well kind of that broader concept of what makes an invasive species, and then kind of nuances of the conversation that we don't have very often, in my opinion. Um, but to start, I wanted to just introduce the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that's the building you're in right now. This is a national wildlife refuge as part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a John D. Dingle Jr. Visitor Center, actually opened on John Dingle's birthday, which who knew? What, what luck. But our mission here is to work with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants across the nation for the benefit of the American people. So we care about habitat as a whole. We're not interested necessarily as much on an individual species as we are in protecting land for land's sake. So we want to have a whole lot of land to be able to help people have that wildlife to be able to see. Now, can you go to all of these properties? No, you cannot access every single national wildlife refuge because if we went everywhere, animals couldn't be anywhere in a lot of ways. When you can come onto our property, it is when it has been deemed compatible for the refuge. So here at Humboldt Marsh, hiking has been deemed compatible because we have decided that getting people in and helping to get them connected through the usage of this unit is very, very important. Humbug Island is not compatible. I am not allowed to go to Humbug Island, even though I work here. There is no purpose for me to go. Visitor services is not over there. Why should I go over there? Um, kind of an abuse of privilege that I respect. I don't just go wherever I want to because it is not my job, and wildlife is being left alone there for a reason. So across our nation, 568 uh, refuges that protect 850 million acres. This is kind of the rough map. There are not 568 dots on it, but you see there's sort of lines going down, one on the East Coast, one along the Mississippi River, kind of a weaker one down the Rocky Mountains, and then another strong one on the Pacific. Those are migratory bird flyways. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service works very hard to manage international species like migratory birds. Uh, and here, because we're an international wildlife refuge, we care a lot about international species. And we work very closely with certain agencies in Canada to do waterfowl stuff, but also lake sturgeon. Sturgeon being just a huge part of our ecosystem here and a big part of the story of the Detroit River. Lake sturgeon is a big place where we go international. Uh, but this is a pretty good representation. They're not in exactly the right spots, but they're pretty close, as close as we can get. I've been to like six of them. There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> there's only six in Michigan. The other one you've probably heard of or could have heard of is Simi National Wildlife Refuge. It's in the Upper Peninsula. Astonishingly beautiful from what I've been told. Hope to make it there sooner than later. So this refuge, like I said, uh, we're the only international refuge, so we're international. We try our best to have partners across the border. We started in 2001. Uh, Humbug Marsh, the unit behind us that we're gonna go into, started, was donated in in 2004. Um, we protect habitat in this area. That is what we do. We protect habitat around the Detroit River, and we try to bring people in to get them to connect and enjoy it. We've got an amazing resource of Humbug Marsh where we're gonna go hike. It is the last undeveloped mile of the Detroit River on the US side of the border. So if you've never heard this story before, it's a very similar story across the country where locals wanted to protect a resource they found valuable. Humbug Marsh was that resource. A long time ago, it was rich person hunting land. That's how it was undeveloped for a long time. It eventually transferred over into some developer, I don't remember the exact name of the company, I can grab a picture maybe and show you later, uh, and they were gonna turn it into houses. They were gonna turn it into development, a theater, a mall, 26 houses on the island, and the bridge across, and the public was like, no. And they stopped it and they saved Humbug Marsh. A lot of those people um, are still alive, or their children are still alive at least, they come, they visit the refuge, and it's really special to me to get to talk to the people that helped create this refuge. Humboldt Marsh is not our only refuge, though. We also have about uh, 20 
units up and down 50 miles of the Detroit River. Uh, we're all the way up to Mud Island, just north of Fighting Island, um, which is on the other side of the border. But And then we are all the way down into Ohio, almost at Erie Marsh Preserve. Uh, we do have kind of like a sister refuge down in Ohio called Ottawa. We work very closely with Ottawa, but we're not the same place. Of all of these, very few of them are open. Uh, we are open here, the Humbug Marsh, our strong unit and our fixed unit are open. So down here, the strong and the fixed unit are open. And Sugar Island is open every once in a while during the summer. You can go to one side of it and enjoy the beach. And that's it. Um, as far as land we have, because we're here for wildlife. We're not wildlife first, we're everybody first. We're wildlife and people first. But for people to be able to have all the wildlife they want, there does have to be refuge for it to live without the threat of being disturbed by teenagers or dogs or bikes or what have you. Um, that's kind of the introduction of me, this place, the refuge, and what we're here for. But now I want to transfer over to like, what makes it invasive. What is an invasive species? Oh, what do you want? <laughs> Hello. Just getting the good stuff, <laughs> I think. Uh, so yeah, what makes a species invasive? Um, does anyone have any ideas what makes a species invasive? Non-native. Non-native, that's a great first step. It's not always true. Mm -hmm. Some non-native species are not invasive, and if I, if I can, I'll be able to show you one on our hike, mm -hmm. um, but that is, very normal. It's very normal for an invasive species to be not native, but it's not a guarantee it's an invasive species. Uh, any other ideas? Who uh, determines student? that it's invasive? Oh, good point. So that's we should what, start there. What is yeah, exactly what makes it technically an invasive species, and it's not its country of origin? Do you have an idea of what makes it an, an invasive species? Uh, that it uh, takes over the native vegetation. Absolutely, yeah. So that's going to be um, a, a thing that an invasive species does, um, but some native species can do the same thing. Correct. Uh, so an invasive species is a species that causes harm, usually monetary harm to people. That's when it comes down to it, we classify invasives. Essentially, it is does it cause harm to humans or to the environment? If yes, it is invasive. If it's non-native and it doesn't do that, like, like daffodils can grow in eastern woodlands, they don't displace anything. They flower before any other plant does. They're non-native, non-invasive. Uh, so what makes it invasive at the end of the day is that it causes harm. They are not, they're usually not found in, this, in the area they cause, cause harm natively. That is not a 100% truth. Uh, I think that's a really important conversation right now, especially in the US Fish and Wildlife. We're actively changing some of our conversations about invasive species. We no longer want to just label them as Asian carp, because that's not fair. And that's also not the species name of those animals. They're grass carp, they're different actual species name. Now, in a plant that's like Japanese barberry. That's always been that plant's name. If it's invasive, it's invasive. We're probably not going to work to change a common name that's been there forever that has no negative connotation. But fish and wildlife cares, and it is a complicated conversation. And so we're trying to broaden the understanding of what makes a species invasive, and it's important as we move forward in modern times. So we know what it is. Like It is a species that causes harm. But why is it invasive? What about invasive species allows them to take over as well as they can? Um, and any ideas about what? So they, they cover everything. That was one. Um, yeah. They, they don't have a natural predator. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no um, system of checks and balances for the plant or the animal. Yep. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So Nothing kills it. Nothing kills it. <laughs> Or Nothing it. kills it, or very few things do, and not at the number that we need them to. Um, and they grow really fast. So kind of a list, a concept list, they grow quickly. 
and they consume resources while they do it. So this is both plants and animals. Plants that are invasive species frequently have very deep tap roots, so they can get to more water faster. And that means they can survive a drought better than maybe a native plant, and so they consume resources. Every drop of water a weed sucks up, a native plant can't get it. So consume resources, consume resources. With animals, they eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Mute swans can defoliate the aquatic vegetation. They consume resources and, and they grow quickly. A lot of non-native or a lot of invasive species grow fast. And that's kind of the trick as well. In their habitats, it's fine. They have predators that can knock them back. In our habitats, no predators, the growth. And I think you can watch frogbit grow overnight, basically. And we'll talk, or I'll show you what frogbit is. It's a new invasive species. Yeah. Uh, I, if you don't mind, I have an Shrub additional bird. comment yeah. for that. So like, for instance, invasive shrubs. Um, a really key, good key indicator for it being an invasive is it'll be the fur, the leaves that, well, the leaves will pop out first or before almost anything else in the spring, and it'll be one of the last ones to lose its leaves in the fall. And so that kind of shows how it outcompetes is that the leaves will be out much longer than almost any native species, and that's why it's able to get more sunlight, more water, more resources away from those other plants. Yeah, they literally shade out other leaves, and those plants underneath it can't. So a really big example in trees is Norway maple. Their leaves are huge, they cover everything, and they block the sun for everything underneath it. It's a pretty tree. I mean, it's, it's pretty. But it's a big weed, and that's a great, it's a great indicator. Leaved out first, it's getting that sun. It's consuming that resource while the sun is always around. If you're underneath the plant, you can't see the sun. So absolutely, like consume resources grow fast. When they do reproduce, they do it in big numbers, and they do it fast. Uh, a lot of invasive plants make a bunch of seeds, and those seeds get everywhere. Uh, and it's a problem. And so one thing like clean boats, clean waters, um, and it, it, you have to clean things as you move from place to place. If you hike all over the world, if you don't clean your boots in between hikes, you could be spreading those seeds because a lot of invasive species for plants, their seeds are really small, they're very easy to travel around the world, and they have. They have. Agriculture, global economy, a lot of things have gotten everywhere, and when they get there, they breed super duper fast. For animals, same idea. I'm going to talk about an insect that literally just clones itself. What do you do about that? It can just literally spit out babies. Uh, like, it is an impossible goal. Uh, yeah? Are there any native and will be, uh, and, but also invasive? Or are they always, if it's invasive, they have to be non native? No, that's a great question. And I, I'm absolutely going to talk about that. Um, native plants can start to cause harm. A uh, grapevine is absolutely a great example of it. Grapevine is a menace. It'll outgrow everything, it'll grow all the way to the top, it'll fill it with leaves. When the tops of trees get really heavy in a big windstorm, they can snap. So we can crown the tree, it knocks the crown of the tree off, which then inhibits the tree's growth. Grapevine, Woo! But it is native. It's just growing too fast around here. Something so they are has invasive changed. then? Uh, they are invasive, yes. They are native invasive species. There's a tree called black locust. It is native to Southeast United States and other parts of the country. It is considered an invasive. Uh, like around here, it is an invasive. And it has thorns on it, so when you reach down to grab it and you pull up and your hand slips, thorns. Uh, black locust is a nasty tree, uh, but it's great to build with. So what do you do? I have just skipped ahead in my PowerPoint, yes. Um, and you may talk about this later, but I, I'm wondering if you'll astap, kind of talk about why these native species have become invasive. Maybe there's things that have caused that to happen. I don't know if you'll talk about that now or if you want to answer it. Yeah, um, so habitat change happens. Um, one thing, an example would be red fox. Red fox have always been in North America, have not always been all over the United States. Uh, in the northeast of the United States, before European settlement came in and changed land usage, red fox were not around. Gray fox were, red fox weren't. When humans came in and switched things over, sorry, humans, rude. Um, when land was developed more, 
it changed. The more trees were taken down, the more open the habitat was, the more foxes came in. The more people built cities, the more red foxes came in. And so they were not there originally. Hum uh, uh, people changed the entire area. Now red fox can come in. Um, I don't know how it impacts every species. Like I can't say why black locust is just such a pest up here. Down south, there's probably other trees that can compete with it, alongside it, for that growth, for that speed of growth of taking over. Up here, the only trees that compete with it are also invasive, basically. So it's competing with other yucky um, plants. Yeah? Uh, OK, so I need clarification sure. on the terms aggressive versus invasive. Because I was corrected one time. I said invasive, and they said, no, is it aggressive? So what the heck? Sure, that was probably someone being pedantic about whether it was native or non-native. Um, so they probably wanted invasive to only be used with non-native. Uh, I've also used the word injurious. Oh. So an injurious species causes injury to, and and uh, and it's but like to me injurious is a step above the invasive. Like invasive's bad. Injurious is like whoa. <laughs> um, when I worked at the zoo, the meerkats were labeled as injurious. Like if they got out into the American West, it would be gone. Like, meerkats are such successful animals, it's, it, the scientists have 100% confidence they would outcompete the prairie dogs and just they'd be over. So they're not just a, like a non-native species. People have taken the next step and be like, if these got out, they would cause severe injury to the habitat. I only ever heard that when I worked at a zoo. So yeah, these terms get really, like we throw them around like it's nothing, that's not fair. Um, so an invasive species causes harm in some way. A native species has traditionally been found in this area hundreds of years ago, and a, a non-native species is more recently introduced. When does that change? When is a non-native species a native species? That's for someone else to figure out. Like there's a plant that's been here since Europeans got here, is it, non is it still non-native, or is it native? I, you know, and that's a conversation we have in Australia with dingoes. They're wild dogs, but they weren't native, but they've been there for so long, they're an Australian wild dog. Like, we think of dingoes as wild Australian animals, they're a non-native species. Are they native now? I, yeah, it's all for humans and our culture to decide on, so. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Um, it doesn't change whenever we decide to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like everything in life, it, it'll change when we decide to change it, okay. basically. Um, so they have, they reproduce fast, and in really high numbers, they have a very generalized diet. If you eat anything, you have a much higher chance of surviving. Invasive species can't be specialists, because if anything were to change, their system collapses. They have to be generalists. They have to just be able to live anywhere, eat anything, and be good to go. Um, uh, an example around the world, which I'll talk about, raccoons. We know them, we love them. Um, raccoons in Europe aren't from Europe, and they mess with that place hard. Like, Germany is overrun with raccoons in some areas. They're generous, they live really well. They're also what we consider urban wildlife, so they live especially well around people. Same with red fox. That's why red fox numbers increased in the Northeast. More humans live there, more red fox. Um, but yeah, raccoons are a problem. Just in, in other parts of the world, here, they're kind of also a problem, but we wouldn't classify them as invasive, just a nuisance. Um, Japan made a raccoon cartoon character years and years and years ago, and then everyone imported raccoons as pets, and now there's raccoons all over parts of Japan as well, because the pet trade does stuff like that. It's a lot of non-native invasive species come in because of the pet trade, and then people just releasing them because they can't take care of it. So yeah, it, it's it, we throw things around a little more than we should. Um, but yeah, they, they, the generalized diet for the raccoon, bullfrogs, great example. They eat anything. It's a generalized diet, so they can absolutely. And then no predators in the area that was mentioned earlier. Even if there is something that can eat it, 
they can't eat it in the same amount of numbers that matters because they reproduce so quickly. So it's, it's even if something can eat it, it probably can't eat it at the speed at which it needs to eat it for the, the invasive species to not become a big problem. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some specific examples. I have some favorites. Um, this is a favorite of mine. I know they are a problem. God, I love common starlings though. Um, so they're actually uh, threatened in their native habitat. In Northern Europe especially, they have very low population numbers now. Not 100% sure why, but it's quirky because they're a pest species in this country and they are threatened in their native habitat. They'll send them any, any yeah. number they want. Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> like, literally, well, I'll ship them off by the tree full. Um, but they, like, they didn't mean to be here. They're just doing their best, and this happens to be a place where they live now. They actually live basically all around the world where they can in temperate climates. Some people who love Shakespeare introduced them into Central Park because they thought it would be fun. Um, at one point, this group of people introduced every single bird Shakespeare mentioned into Central Park while they were performing the play. It was the late 1800s. Things happened. Um, and like, yeah. Uh, now, they're everywhere. Within 50 years, the, the common starlings made it all the way across the nation and are now kind of a pest everywhere. Um, but the starlings, are connected to our next native, or some of the other species I'm about to talk about. One later on, though. So white mulberry, it was actually introduced into the United States at about the same time European starlings were. White mulberry, uh, mulberry trees are all over the world. There's different species in different places in the world. White mulberries are Asian. They are great there. They're a perfect food source for a lot of insects. They are really essential for the silk trade, and they were brought to Massachusetts in the attempt to create a Western silk industry. It didn't work. So they were brought over to be food for gypsy moths. So gypsy moths were also brought to Massachusetts to try to create a silk industry. But gypsy moths and the white mulberries escaped from the house of the person who didn't actually know the name of the person, but I didn't want to put it in there. It seemed rude. <laughs> um, some French guy. And uh, they escaped through the window. And now there's gypsy moths and white mulberries everywhere. So the white mulberries, um, the way you can tell the difference is the shininess on the leaf. You're not going to see a red mulberry. Uh, I shouldn't say such definitive statements like that but you're probably not gonna see a red mulberry because the white mulberry tree is just that effective. It's a super weed, but it's, it's tasty. I eat them, birds eat them, animals eat them, and they poop them and they spread them everywhere. Mm -hmm. And because they grow faster than our native red mulberries, they outcompeted the red mulberries. If you're lucky and you see one, the top of the red mulberry leaf is glabrous, which is a pointless science word meaning rough, I think. We just love science words to describe things like that. And it just, it's rough. It's not shiny, is what it means. So that's how you can tell a native versus a non-native. Mulberry is one of only two trees that has a variation in leaf shape. So all of those are mulberry leaves. It's cute because it does the mitten thing. So we can have the Michigan leaves every once in a while. Um, but they also have no lobes whatsoever. And then the bottom left, a lot of lobes, a lot of separation in the leaves. So mulberry is really cool for that reason. As a non-native uh, invasive, it's a big problem. It was brought in for gypsy moths. I don't know if you have ever seen the caterpillars. Um, this is gypsy moth caterpillars. I mean, I'm not gonna tell you to just kill things you see in nature, but these are, can be very bad. I've never lived through an outbreak. From what I understand, they will take every leaf off a tree. They will go to the ground with, moth, with, with silk. It's dumbness. Like, it, you will remember it if you have seen a gypsy moth outbreak. I have never seen one. Um, so what's the one that's different there? Oh, uh, I don't know, honestly. Uh, oh, they're, um, the way caterpillars grow is in a process called instars. So uh, caterpillars get bigger and they molt. And every molt, they, change, they can change a little bit. So the biggest one is probably just a older 
caterpillar, still a gypsy moth caterpillar, because there's multiple sizes. Mm -hmm. When they first hatch, it's a first in star. Eat a lot, molt second in star. When they get up to the fifth in star is when they uh, crystal pupate and then become an adult. Um, yeah. I have heard that apparently gypsy moths, uh, the caterpillars, are hazardous to touch. Have you heard anything about that as well? Uh, the spiky hairs on gypsy moth caterpillars can irritate your skin. Um, so it can be an irritant if you touch it. It's definitely an irritant if you eat it. Please don't eat gypsy moth caterpillars. <laughs> I don't feel like I have to say that much, but these guys do. Some European starlings have learned to eat gypsy moth caterpillars, and it is not uncommon for if you give it enough time, something will figure out how to eat it. And European starlings have. Not all of them. They're very, very smart birds. They can teach each other things. They can learn things. And certain family groups have figured it out. They bite the head off. They grab the skin. They flick it inside out. They nip off the squishy insides. And they leave perfectly turned inside out gypsy moth skin yeah. or gypsy caterpillar skins. <laughs> and it's weird and creepy if you see it because you're like, whoa, <laughs> yikes. But it's cool. Except it's an invasive species eating an invasive species. So have we won? Did two rights make a wrong or something? Did two wrongs make a right? Uh, um, and just random detail about starlings. If you see all the white spots on their feathers, that's actually the tip of the feather degrading. So that's not pigment. That's not color. That is the feather physically breaking down. And that is what's causing its like its pattern and I think that it in, in nature the removal of something to create the pattern is very rare and very interesting to me that physically why they look each little white dot on its chest and head is just the very tip of the feather being naturally meant to break down like that to cause that pattern I'm a very big science geek um, and it's just so fascinating to me but oh glory, there's too many, oh too many starlings, and too many white mulberries. I've never actually seen a gypsy moth, so I have no reference point here, but they tell me there's too many of them. Um, and the silk industry failed, clearly, or else we would have a Western silk industry. Like, it failed miserably. Um, the only thing we have from it is uh, invasive pests. So this is, a, this is that insect that can just spit out more of itself. And it's called the oleander aphid. We're not 100% sure where it's from. We think somewhere around the Mediterranean region of the world. It grows very effectively in that climate. It also lives here, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see it. Um, oleander aphids are a huge pest for milkweeds and a lot of other plants around our area. They're an all-female, purely parthenogenic species. So what I mean by that is they clone themselves. And they also have live young. So unlike most insects, which lay eggs, eggs hatch, and then go through a process, aphids literally just birth aphids. And they're ready to go. Day one, they can use their mouth parts, stick it into a plant, suck out the juice. Does it kill the plant? No. Does it slowly inhibit the plant's growth? Yes. Um, so oleander aphids are a new discovery of mine, which I'm very fascinated in. Because uh, as I was walking around looking at our milkweed, I was trying to find monarch butterfly eggs. The tiny little green things lift up the leaf, and I see an icicle. Oh, and so it's a negative, but it's still a fascinating organ. I mean, they are an insect that gives live birth. That is just weird. So any size of them you see, that's just different ages. The biggest ones are the ones that can reproduce. The little ones can't yet. They grow up, they molt, and they will just cover sections of a flower. This invasive, what do you do about it? What do you, what do, you do about the other ones? Starlings, what do we do about it? We try to make noise. They used to do, um, like, uh, you kill a bunch, you turn them in for money, stuff like that, bounties. They used to do bounties on invasive species. I mean, we don't do that stuff anymore. Gypsy moths, you try to spray for them, you try to kill them. Almost nobody does anything about white mulberries. That's just not even, a, not even on people's radar as an invasive species to remove. Some of because they feed the birds. So if an invasive species is feeding birds, what do you, what do, you do? Like, is it even really invasive? Or is it just non-native and a weed? 
is red mold or is white mulberry causing harm? Well, it deplaces a native species, and it kind of is, unfortunately. Um, the specifics of invasives go on and on and on and on and on. Um, we'll talk about a few others. Um, so this is a grass carp. It's one of the multiple species of carp that can cause our area's issues. It's just really effective at being alive. It gets really big, it's a generalist eater, and it lays a lot of eggs when it does lay eggs. So it's all, it ticks all those boxes of what traits do as a species have that allows it to become something we would classify as invasive. So as U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we do have fisheries offices inside of this building. If you remember the 100-year-old sturgeon that was caught a few months ago in the Detroit River, that was these folks. Um, they do a lot of work to try to catch and remove invasives, not just this type of carp. There's another type of carp called a goldfish. Uh, and goldfish also can get into our waters and get to like head size. So aquatic monitoring, invasive monitoring for our fisheries department, there's a lot of, lot of carp, a lot of species like that that get really big. What do we do about it? In the lakes, what can you? Lake Michigan's huge. You, you can't really fight it in there as well as you can maybe in the river where it's a smaller amount of water you possibly can get a stop in. You possibly can find a place where they have not made it and now you can just harvest, 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 sample, sample, sample and try to pull them all out before they get north. It's hard. It's really hard work and these fish have caused a lot of damage to our local fish ecosystems. It's not the fish's fault. I think that's kind of an important thing to think about in invasive species. It's not the animal's fault. They are here, they are living their best. It's just that their best is a little better than our best right now. Um, garlic mustard is another really, really common invasive species. A lot of people have heard of this. It's a common thing to go out and pull um, because it, it responds very well to pulling. You can easily get it up out of the dirt. It was brought over here by Italians to cook with because yay and tasty and a lot of cultures brought the food they ate to wherever they were going. That's super duper normal. This plant though can create a monoculture in our woodlands taking over the entire understory making it impossible for other plants to be able to grow. And people just don't eat it in the amount necessary to take it out of the ecosystem. Um, a monoculture is the term we use when every single organism you see is the exact same species. So like Iowa is a monoculture of corn. It is all corn. Um, our grass is a monoculture of grass. Um, so garlic mustard, really big problem. Um, a tree invasive, um, this is tree of heaven. So this is not the tree, this is just a leaf of tree of heaven. And a leaf of tree of heaven starts here and extends all the way up. So that's like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, some other math, uh, <laughs> 20, I mean, we're getting to like 30 by the time you get down. So 30 little leaflets to make up one leaf, they get even bigger. Um, Tree of Heaven grow really fast. They're very common on the edges of construction sites, the edges of disturbed land. They're just because they grow so fast, they absorb so much more water, they take in so many other resources, native species can't compete with the water drain, with the amount their leaves cover up everything. Do they have pretty flowers? Yes, no. that is why they are in America. Um, because if it's pretty, we planted it here maybe, and now we have to deal with the consequences. Blank slide randomly, um, Phragmites. Huge grass issue. Is it pretty? No. Uh, it got here on accident. It was just in agriculture, it was in dirt, it got over it, and now it's growing everywhere. It could have also been purposely brought over as a hay crop for cattle. Some grasses in this country that are invasive were brought over here to grow food for your animals. It, it, it makes sense if you're thinking about it, you're moving to a new place, you're bringing your pets, you want food for your pets, you plant food for your pets. But Phragmites is just, it just outcompetes. It grows faster and faster and faster, and a lot of grasses don't grow an individual plant from an individual seed. So the grass can shoot a root out and pop up another stem. Same plant pops up another stem. 
So one couple little grass, one little clump can grow. A cattail, which is what should be where Phragmites are, one cattail grows from one cattail seed. They can't propagate the same way that Phragmites can and other grasses can as well. There are other non-native invasive grasses. Um, I thought the DNR brought those over and planted them to do an experiment here in Michigan. <laughs> I, I mean, people have done a lot of weird things. I've never heard that, I just moved to Michigan, so I don't know all of Michigan history, um, but it, it almost definitely was both unintentionally brought in and then also intentionally brought in. A lot of invasives uh, in farmland were brought in to hold the soil together in between crops or to hold the soil together on the edges. There's a really common plant called crown vetch, um, and it is super invasive, but it was brought in for a purpose. It was brought in to be ground cover to stop erosion from taking away your soil in the winter time. So this is what holds Louisiana together. Like half of Louisiana wouldn't exist without Phragmites. And there actually are native species of Phrag. Like native species of Phragmites exists. It's just the non-native push them all out because they just grow faster. Um, personal issues, uh, swans. So the mute swan, the orange at the tip, black by the face, non-native invasive swan. Mute swans are bad. Mute swans are very bad. Um, they attack other birds, they eat all the food, they it just, they're a nuisance species. They are a problem, and then because they're pretty, it makes it impossible for scientists to take care of it. Because people's emotions start to impact with ecology. So my best example of why mute swans are bad, even though they're pretty, are like popular girls in high school. <laughs> yeah, maybe they were cute, but they were terrible. <laughs> and like that's and people get it. They're like, oh yeah, I remember those girls. Yeah. So yeah, they're pretty. They're great, but they're awful. And like they attack you. They, oh yeah, swans. Yes. Yeah, I was gonna add on to that. Meet swans. If you actually are near them in the water, they will try and drown you. <laughs> like they, have, they will they, try and drown you. They, they are very aggressive. Them. Like they have. Wow. Them. It's intense. They can kill your dog. No question. They hit. It hit it with the wing, if you think about a bird that heavy, can fly, how strong it must be. So that thing hits you, you're having a bad day. Yeah, no, mute swans are terrible. Tundra swans and trumpeter swans, they're fine. They're native. Um, the tundra swans are way farther north. We're the southern range of a tundra swan. Probably not likely to see, honestly. Trumpeters would be the more common of the native species in our area, but because mute swans are so prolific, they pushed a lot out, unfortunately. Uh, and the East Coast on Long Island, where I lived, they were brought in because a bunch of British people lived there and they wanted to see the animals they were used to seeing back home. They as well, back in the day, the feathers were great quilts. So there was more of a purpose, but now they're just a giant pest species. What do you do with it? <sighs> it's hard. It's hard. Like all invasive species is so much effort. Phragmites, you burn it, you cut it, you mow it, you burn it, you cut it, you mow it, you spray it, you burn it. You maybe make an impact. Maybe. Uh, reed canary grass, the grass I'll show you, you mill it, so you just cut it all up in the soil, you mow it down, you till the soil up really well. There's even like two inches of root, it can regrow. So it's just a perpetual. So with swans, they, they breed fast, they make a lot of themselves, they're really mean, and so you don't want to get near them. Sometimes we do go out and people will have a cult, so they will kill the swans. Is this our best option? Some days yes, but it's never good. It's, or it's like it's never fun. It's helpful for the environment, we don't want to do that. We don't want to have to go do things like that, but we want to have an ecosystem that can support 20 different species of waterfowl and not just swans. And so choices have to be made sometimes and invasive management that are not happy, but are necessary for the greater good of the whole system. So I, I wanted to talk about invasives from our country and other places, and I kind of mentioned them, a little bit already, but bullfrogs, big example. Bullfrogs are a huge pest species, 
most of the world around at this point. There are bullies, literally, in the water. They can eat almost anything that they can fit into their face, and they just keep going. It takes two years for them to grow up, so they need good water to, to grow up as a tadpole, but once they're an adult, they can live about 10 years, and they are good at it. They're good at making babies, and they're good at eating everything. We can eat bullfrogs. Some people do. Some countries try to get rid of them, try to increase the uh, hunt for it to get rid of bullfrogs. Does it work? Not really. Um, they deplace uh, native frog species because they're just better at it than some of the natives. So it's unfortunate. It's a normal species for us. It's a negative species for them. It's also invasive in the United States where it is not natively found. So on the West Coast, where it would not have been natively found, a bullfrog is considered an invasive species, even though it was originally found in the country. If you think about that, though, countries are big, and there's more than one habitat type. So I mean, this side of the Rockies versus that side of the Rockies, technically it's the same country, but geography-wise, it's a really big space. And wildlife doesn't live off of human country boundaries. Um, raccoons. Yeah, um, again, another big problem, Europe, UK, Japan, brought them over because they were cute, thought they were fun, maybe someone tried to start a fur industry, things got out of hand, um, adorable as they are. Grape, again, same conversation, I think I actually talked about all of these already, um, grapevine, really cool, tasty, the wild grapes are great. There's actually, I think there's about 10 species of grapes in the world, and the majority of them are native to North America, not France. I think I read like seven are native to North America, and only one is actually native to France, which in our brains, we just always relate France and grapes together, which I think is kind of interesting that they're more an American species, um, but they can outgrow. That tree is now covered in grapevine. And, and, and if that was the only vine that did that, cool. It's one of many vines that do that. It just happens to be a native species that is currently thriving a little bit more than we realized. Um, the black locust, another species I mentioned, um, that's the leaf on the left side. So it's got very, very rounded leaflets uh, and 15 little leaflets that make up one whole leaf. Its flowers are beautiful, white flowers, and it's great for building with because it's heavily rot resistant. If I was gonna go build a fence and I just needed to cut trees down, I would cut black locusts down because they're not gonna rot in the ground. So if you were planting trees to use, it's a great tree. Grows fast, covered in thorns, really awful. Uh, and the American Southeast, it's totally fine. It's totally normal. Up here, Long Island, where I used to live, absolutely not. Black locusts are very bad. Um, and then, kind of like this one just as like a special mention in my opinion. Tumbleweed are really interesting. They are not found here. Um, but I still, I just really wanted to mention tumbleweed because they're actually Russian thistle. It's a non-native invasive species that was brought over and has now become almost literally the symbol of the American Southwest. Like you see an old Western, you see a tumbleweed blow across. They were not here 200 years ago. Um, and it's crazy to think to me, honestly. But like, in that same vein, tomatoes are not native to Italy, and it is a staple in Italian food now. So just the world does stuff like that. So this American plant is Russian, um, and it can be bad. They can grow to the point where it'll literally almost cover your house in, in tumbleweed. They're in Australia. It's really bad. If you think about Australian habitat, it's arid. It's very dry in a lot of it. So it's just like the American Southwest. Why wouldn't Russian thistle also take hold there? And it, it's crazy. But it's so cool to me when it breaks off from its roots, the seeds actually fall out while the tumbleweed blows around. And so it's, and it's just an amazing plant to me that I really wish was native and not a non-native invasive to the United States. Um, so that's everything I wanted to do inside. Um, little details, interesting little tidbits about certain invasive species. I do want to go outside real fast and actually show you some of the invasive species we just talked about. Um, not all of them. I promise I won't find tumbleweed. 
but um, oh. I, I definitely will see a, quite a few of them, actually. So the building is locked. So I have keys. You can leave anything in here. No one else can get into the building when we go out and hike. And then when we can return in, grab our stuff, and then head out. So do you have any questions before we meander into the woodlands? OK. Uh, so we're just going to. trail which we're gonna go meander some of it and then we have a two mile trail. Okay. Well. okay. Yeah. Um, so this is Humbug Marsh. This is the beginning of that beautiful uh, nature area that was protected by locals uh, just really even 30 years ago. Um, which is crazy that it's 30 years ago already but uh, as we walk in there's definitely I mean if there's gonna be invasive species right away it's kind of part of an urban environment. This is a very urban area. We are very close to Detroit. We are very close to a large amount of human interference and just effect on nature. So we're gonna get invasives and we're gonna get the natives too. So right off the bat, grapevine. Starting uh, to grow up. It's not terrible, but if we move on, we definitely will see terrible grapevine. Absolutely. Okay. I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Tomorrow my hikes are all about not using your binoculars. Uh, oh, really? A no tools needed naturalist hike. I like to alliterate. Um, yeah, I think it's important to empower people what is this to. Stuff? Uh, it's part of Queen Anne's lace. It's just no, no, no. It's, it's different. It's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I don't know off the top of my head, but I do know that those are oleander aphids. So oh, those orange not, little bugs yeah. that and I wanted milkweed. to mention, yeah. um, right on milkweed. So we're kind of on the edge here. Uh, so there may be more invasives in the forest right here than there would be maybe deeper in. Just as they creep in, they creep in farther and farther. So those oleander aphids are on a lot of our milkweed plants on the edges of our forest and they have definitely stopped the flowers from growing on some of them, which is a bummer. But they don't kill the milkweed. They just inhibit the Stunted. growth. Yes. You can squish them if you want to. That is a... Spray them off yes, the water. They, yeah. And squish is the, like, if you really need to get rid of them, that. Wear gloves because they'll stain your fingers, I guess. Yeah. I never squish them. I do that with aphids on my flowers. Yep, just yep. Take just my pull fingers them off. and go... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, they are a pest. So this grass is sticking up. This is a reed canary grass. It's not a grass I showed you a picture of, but it acts in a lot of the same way Phragmites does, and just it can take over a whole area. Right here, it's got competition. It's got buckthorn, uh, which is a really, really like effective plant. It grows very, very well all over so the reed canary grass has a lot of competition if it didn't have the competition it maybe would monoculture out and be everything and everywhere you need at least two degrees to walk backwards this effectively that's what i tell children during programs because they all want to turn around and walk backwards too no 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 no, no. Uh, I guess it is hard to know what species I'm about to see though. It's fine. Uh, yeah, so we, we opened the grounds last October to hiking. Uh, and then this April, we became seven days a week. And then we finally physically opened the building on July 8th. So it's been a nice slow burn as we get started. And then we also have like more programs. So this is basically the first partner program that the refuge is hosting, um, like this kind of thing. We have had people come in to teach other programs, 
This is the first one in this nature. And I'm starting to do it my own personal hikes and we've got more and more and more and more and more coming. Is that on your web website? Yeah, it's on the Facebook as well as our website. It always posts to Facebook first. It's just fastest. It's just faster. Um, but yeah, we know it needs to be on the website and other places when we can get it there. I can give you the current event calendar when we go back inside. Okay. Yeah. So we've got uh, dead fried my dude. But we have leaf canary grass right next to uh, narrow leaf cattail. Yeah. The narrow leaf cattail is actually a non-native species, but it's cattail, so it's better than reed canary grass. It's a weird conversation that we're having where it's like, well, it, but it's not native. And you're like, yeah, but it's cattail. And so to me, take the cattail, ditch the reed canary grass to purists. They're like, it all has to go broadleaf cattail only. And no. Cattail good. <laughs> Long Island does that with chestnut trees. The chestnut trees had a blight. They almost all disappeared. Um, some are fine. They don't want to reintroduce non-Long Island phenotypic chestnuts onto Long Island because they want to keep it as pure as possible. And in my opinion, let's just get chestnut trees. <laughs> like, yeah. it's fine if they're from Connecticut. Let's go, guys. <laughs> like. <laughs> Even if the tree was from Ohio, I would rather have it here than not have the tree. Um, yeah, a lot of reed canary grass. Along here. It's very frustrating. Uh, frag is a little bit higher of priority around here, but we'll just kind of hit them one at a time as we go. No, okay. So uh, this spot here, um, these are tent caterpillars, and they look like they could be a problem, they are not an invasive species. They're not an injurious species. They are, they just are. They're native. If they were to take over the entire tree, then that would kind of be more of an invasive situation. But if you see a little bit, it's totally fine. It's not something to freak out about. I know a lot of people are kind of concerned when they see a chunk of a tree being eaten like that, but fine. Yeah. Very lucky with the rain. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I thought, I wondered, I didn't know if it would threatened. be yep. outdoor. Uh -huh. there. I pushed it a little more indoors just in case. Um, felt like it's that hanging, was. It's hanging in there. Yep, exactly. It rained this morning. Yeah. Just a, and it rained <laughs> just <laughs> before. Um, yeah, so there's uh, a type of raspberry or blackberry. I'm not exactly sure what the exact species is, but this is a common site in eastern woodlands of some variety. Um, blackberry, wineberry, raspberries, whatever the name is, they're very similar plants. They grow well. I mean, that is basically all, is all raspberries, all wild raspberry and stuff. This is another plant that has three leaves, so don't touch it, but it's not poison ivy. I tell kids not to touch it because it's got thorns. Yeah. Three leaves, it's either pokey or poisonous. Either way, don't. Um, is it invasive because it takes over everywhere? I don't know. That's an argument you can have with other people. If you don't want it to be only this plant, then yeah, you would consider it an invasive. But it is possibly a native. There are also non-natives. So it's kind of without like the expert scientists being able to identify exactly what it is. It could be a native species, it could be a non-native species. Depends on your management, whether or not you think you need to remove it. A lot of animals eat the berries. There is a native variety, so we don't fight it very hard. Um, some things, if there's not even a native variety, we may fight it a little harder. It's wine, it's wine berries, it's blackberries. You wanna eat them. Like, I do. Same with the mulberries, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't like that it's the non-native mulberry, but I like that there are mulberries I can eat. It's a quandary. Um, there's a tree, uh, there are different olive trees from around the world. And then I remember in the American Southwest, an invasive species of olive became the primary nesting habitat for an endangered species of bird. Oh, what do you go. do? Like you want their olive gone, but the endangered species only nests in that tree now. Oh. Yeah, 
but that's nature. It's not, it doesn't care. What we do. It's just do it. Uh, life finds a way. All of it done. Just totally made a little tent underneath. I think it's beautiful. I think it's cool. It's really bad for the tree. Um, Here, I didn't actually have a picture of it. I intended to. Um, there's little lily pads right in the water in there. There's tiny little lily pads um, right in and amongst the other green plants. And that is a species called frog bit. And it is super Oh, invasive. I see them now. Yeah, they look it's like little got lily look pads. Really They're really cute. They're very pretty. They're very invasive. They're heavily sold right now in the... Uh, Aquarium trade, just because they look nice, but they're a really big problem. Is uh, bush? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I know. I love this spot. You can see almost straight out with the cattail are a little lower. The an egret yeah, out there. Yeah. Yep. It yeah. Just looks so much bigger. It's yeah. Big. It's a beautiful location. Could a green hair? Because I don't have my digging. I'm sorry. I should have <laughs> told you, Weaver. Yeah. yeah, this is kind of the quickie of some of the species I wanted to show you. We can just walk informally the rest of the trail if you want to, talk about stuff, uh, ask questions as you want to kind of idea. We are going to head back this way and then cut into the woods more. Um, basically, hike what we hiked earlier today as well. Um, so yeah, essentially the program is as over as it needs to be until we feel like being done talking. I am so happy to keep answering questions because it's not five o'clock yet. So let's keep hiking. If you have questions, feel free to ask them. If I see other stuff, I'll try to point it out. It's fun. <laughs>